Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Student Hub Live. Well, I'm really looking forward to this very special event today. Different perspectives, exploring big questions from different points of view. My name is Karen Foley and uh, I'm a lecturer at The Open University and I'm the presenter also today at Student Hub Live, the OU's online platform for academic community. And a big welcome to everybody out there. I know you're all taking your seats in the chat and getting to know each other, filling in our map to let us know where you are, what you're doing, etc. Well, I'm in West Wales at the moment. It is pouring with rain. My dogs are um, under the table, behaving for now as they may be, um, but uh, who knows what could happen. Um, in the next space of, of the, the time that we have today together. I'm joined by a really fabulous panel uh, today in our virtual studio. Um, and we also have some lovely people um, who are on the hot desk who are going to collate all of your feedback and uh, bring them to us as we have a big discussion around four really important hot topics. So on our panel today, I'm joined by Martin Weller, John Baxter, George Curry and Rahana Arwan. And I'm going to ask each of them to say hello and let you know a little bit about some of the lenses that they're going to approach today's conversation. Because one thing that we have decided is that the last year has taught us so many different things. And even now, it is so much more important that we bring these different interdisciplinary aspects to solving some of these big complex questions that we're going to start to get to grips with today. So first, if I could come to you, Martin, how are you? And uh, what can you tell our audience today about what you're bringing to our discussion? Hi, yeah, I'm good. Hi, Karen. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm in Cardiff, so I'm just east of uh, Karen, so I expect I'll be getting your rain quite soon. Uh, I'm a professor of educational technology uh, at the Open University. I've been at the OU for 26 years, uh, so st still a newbie in OU terms. You know, but, uh, so my main interest in, uh, is in educational technology. I'm also the chair of the Open program, um, and it's been interesting over the past year in the pandemic, uh, particularly someone in my field, because suddenly educational technology was kind of front and center. Suddenly, all these other universities had to go online. I've been doing lots of talks about what can we learn from the Open University about doing online education. So that's been a really interesting thing through the pandemic. And some of what I'll be talking about uh, today will be around technology and that. So it's good to be here. Brilliant. Thank you. And we're, we're very delighted that you could join us. John, would you like to say hello? Hi, I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm uh, sitting on the edge of the Peak District and in, in Glossop. It's a bit sunny here, so we haven't got any any rain yet. I'm uh, I started life as a chemist, but for many years I've been involved in interdisciplinary studies. I'm currently the, the qualification director for the open degree. And recently I've been thinking about what's popularly called wicked problems, which are interdisciplinary problems, which are difficult to solve. And uh, the difficulties that some educational institutions sometimes have in, in teaching interdisciplinarity and bringing together disparate subjects. So today's talk is, is right up my street. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. George, would you like to say hello next? I certainly would. Yes. Hello. I'm George Curry. I'm in Hertfordshire today and it's, I'm going to say sunny, but I don't, I don't think it's going to last, to be honest, because there's some dark clouds out there. Um, I too have worked for the OU for 26 years. So newbie as well martin <laughs> i've done my undergraduate degree and my masters as an ou student so i kind of understand it from that perspective as well and currently i manage the ou's access provision um, but i'm also co-chair of one of the modules in the open program called making your learning count which lets students not only choose uh, use credit that they've used courses that they've done elsewhere towards credit in a qualification, but it lets students think about mixing a variety of different subjects together to, to really hone in on what, what interests them. Um, outside of work, I'm a musician and an actress, and so I will be coming to today's talk with uh, an interest in the arts. And if George doesn't mention Hamilton, I'll eat my hat today. <laughs> That's guaranteed. Right, um, and last but by no means least, we have Rahana. Rahana, would you like to say hello? Hello, um, so I'm Rahana Awan and I'm uh, I'm in Rygate in Surrey and at the moment actually the weather seems to be holding off but hopefully the big rain cloud isn't going to kind of open any minute now and you won't hear lots of pitter patter on the roof. Um, so I'm staff tutor for the open programme which means that I look after sort of the associate lecturers that um, 
work across the program but also kind of look after the student experience as well um, and um, I come to it today as an interdisciplinarian myself. So my background, my first degree was in social sciences. So I did a combined honours degree. So I have history and politics, but I also did psychology and sociology. Um, and I think it just gives you that breadth and understanding of broader sub, the, the breadth and understanding that you get gives you a broader understanding of some of these big questions that we're going to be looking at today. Um, I also um, am, an OU student so um, I really enjoy the idea of being on both sides of the fence so really pleased to be here today so thank you for having me. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone. Well, gosh, if that's not a lot that we bring to the table to discuss, um, then, you know, I don't know what is. But we have um, uh, lots of people talking um, at, on the hot desk. And uh, we have uh, Linda, Mary and Jay who are moderating the chat. Um, Mary, can I come to you very briefly and see what people are talking about at home? And would you like to say hello? You've been uh, very involved in organising this event, Mary. So uh, what's happening down with you? Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. This is my first Student Hub Live event, so I'm quite excited about it. Um, so I'm the, uh, I look after the Open program, which includes also a qualification manager for the Open degree. So this is really exciting to be able to see kind of all the discussions that are going on. And there's some great chat going on. People are um, sort of engaging with the widgets and they're getting to know each other. And there's some great people who are, who are meeting up as well who have realised that they're on the same courses, which is really good because, you know, it's, it's great to be able to kind of create that community for people and, and people can interact and get to meet each other. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Mary. And Linda and Jay, I'll invite you to say hello when we bring um, your uh, discussions and contributions. But we must crack on because we've got an awful lot to cover today. So please fill in the widgets and the map. We've got these word clouds there, which um, need three things. Otherwise, the computer says no. So if you can only think of one or two things, that's absolutely fine. But you need to then put a full stop or a cross or something in that box. When you fill those word clouds in, you can then see what other people say. And we'd really like to use those as a sort of way to generate some thought um, about some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. They're all very self-explanatory questions, so if you could have a go filling those in, the map should be the most simple to do. Um, and I hear that's populating really nicely, so we'll show you that in just a moment. But let's go to our first big question of the day, and I'm hoping that you will join in the chat um, with this. So one of the things that we've been thinking about um, is, is around these whole ideas of um, uh, the environment. And so I'm going to come to Rahana first. Sorry, I've just lost my actual big question. Let's see um, what the big question is that we've got. So we'd like to know from you at home, what are the three words that come to mind for environment? And then our question to sort of frame the discussion is, what impact has the pandemic had on the environment? And we're looking at that in both positive and negative terms. So we're all going to sort of offer our different lenses and contribute aspects to that. But Rahana, if I could ask you to lead on this particular one, what, what are your thoughts on the impact on environment of, of what's been going on? Thank you. So I think the environment has sort of with the pandemic, we've seen huge changes. There were about 3 billion people across the world that all went into lockdown at the same time. So there had to be some impact on what was happening around us. Um, and we started to see things, so we had restrictions in movement. Um, so that meant that activities stopped. So like shopping and driving, and this all had a huge positive impact on things like uh, air pollution. So there was a reduction in air pollution. There's been a reduction in some waste that we've been um, emitting from our homes. Uh, there's been a reduced pressure on tourist destinations. So we saw images of London where there, w there just weren't people. And of course, if people aren't flying, that's a reduction in air pollution. Um, and we also saw water pollution as well kind of reduced significantly. People started to shop locally. So people's buying and consuming habits changed. Um, but one of the things to think about is kind of how sustainable is that? How is that? How long term is that impact? Um, and also things like sort of, you know, the impact on climate change. So um, in China, there was something like 50% reduction in greenhouse gases, which is incredible. Absolutely incredible if you think about that. But thinking about coming at it from different subject areas, we can start to unpick some of these items. So we can think about it in terms of geography, the way that people move. We can think about it in terms of um, 
you know, are we going to impact on laws? Are things going to change politically because of the, the positive impact on the environment? Having said that, there have been some negatives as well. And one of the things we've seen, I don't know about you, is uh, our Amazon shopping went up sort of probably about fivefold. But sometimes that would mean that we'd have maybe three drivers in one day coming to our house. So how can that be a better thing for the environment? Um, also, the amount of packaging, like my children would order you know, some pens that would come in a huge box about this big with all of this um, polystyrene packaging as well as the, the cardboard that went with it. So household waste suddenly increased and actually recycling started to decrease. So we can start to think about this from a sociological point of view as well as the impact on society of the pandemic and of waste. Um, so it's um, the increase in online shopping has really kind of had a bit of an, a negative impact as well. So um, the other thing is thinking about PPE, you know, that the whole kind of protective um, equipment that people have started to buy and the, the plastic masks and how we dispose of those. So there are lots of positives, but I think there are also some negatives and, and really thinking about how how has the pandemic affected how we think and feel about the environment and how sustainable are those changes going to be and how quickly are we just going to revert back and one of the things that i think you can really see a difference in since the easing of lockdown is the traffic you know again very quickly people were like oh i'm going to walk everywhere i'm just going to walk and then suddenly you know we were in a traffic queue yesterday which we haven't been in one for about a year so are people just going to slip back into their old habits Mm, interesting. So a lot there going on, Rahani, you've mentioned so many different things. Um, and, and as Peter said, you know, people have thought a lot more about locality. And some of the aspects that you're talking about are things that are very visible to us, like packaging, etc. But yet, it always depends on what we count and how we're counting it, doesn't it? Because, you know, one could argue that while there's been an increase in deliveries, because we aren't able to go out shopping, equally, by collating some of those, um, uh, from a better sort of organisational perspective, means that we can be more economic in those sorts of terms. So, you know, is going out to the car or having one person you know bringing 20 packages as sometimes happens in my household um you know is that more environmentally friendly but a lot of the things that you're talking about here are very visible and obvious um there are also some hidden aspects to the environment and i think that um you know streaming services are one thing that we were talking about the other day that personally i'd never even considered as an environmental factor george you've been watching a lot of netflix what do you think <laughs> I certainly have, and, and and I'm not alone in that, have I? I mean, we know that um, Netflix consumption nearly doubled in 2019, and it's only gone on to increase more during the pandemic as, as people didn't have a lot else to do. But did you know that watching one film on Netflix uses the same amount of energy as making 60 cups of tea? And watching a half hour programme on Netflix is the equivalent of driving four miles. Um, in terms of the energy used. So that's, as you say, a sort of invisible cost. You think like you, you feel like you're not doing anything wrong just sitting at your, on your sofa watching telly, but actually there are these massive servers, these massive buildings with banks and banks and banks of computing equipment generating um, lots of, using lots of energy, allowing us to do that. So yeah, certainly a hidden environmental cost there. Mm, absolutely. And people are talking about the silence as well that we've had. Um, I know Martin was talking about going to Cardiff and I've seen some pictures lately about, you know, things sort of resuming back to normal. But I um, remember seeing all those pictures of ghost towns. Let's take a look um, and see what everybody said at home when we asked about some of the questions um, around environment. And then perhaps somebody else would like to pick up um, on what our viewers think. So here's our word cloud that we can see. So there's lots of things here, climate change being the most common, but there are also things about sustainability, nature, less commuting. Um, so I wonder if anyone would like to pick up on some of those things, plastic responsibility. So various outputs and also, as Rahana sort of mentioned earlier, various behavioural changes. Martin, what do you think? I think uh, the point Rahana makes about how much of this will carry on post pandemic is really interesting. So lots of us were forced into being home workers, for instance, you know, which tax, uh, which reduces commuting. Um, 
And then I've seen some companies have put pressure on people to come back to businesses and come back to offices, you know, and obviously offices themselves use lots of energy. But I think equally, we're going to see lots of people saying, you know what, I actually quite like this home working thing. I don't want to go back to doing that commute. So I think that what we see over the next year or two, that kind of the outwash of the pandemic, if you like, will have a big impact on this. And then it's not just that so there'll be a big environmental impact, but those things will be decided by lots of other factors are kind of about how, how the new economy works out, you know, what people's preferences are, where they want to work and those kind of things. Mm, absolutely. Linda, let's come to you because uh, you're on our hot desk and you haven't said hello yet. So could you just give us a nice hello um, and let us know what everyone at home is talking about? <clears throat> Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Linda Robson. I'm from the um, School of Engineering and Innovation, and I've been managing the chat this morning along with Mary. Um, so one of the things that um, I particularly noticed was people talking about working from home um, improves the environment and potentially improves improves quality of life but obviously that's a two-edged sword some people have really enjoyed working from home and others have found it really really challenging so that's that's a really interesting point to to think about Mm. And one of the things we're going to be talking about a little bit later on is, is around mental health. And I think that's been one of the things that's been quite challenging to look at. So some of these things are, you know, sort of quite easy to measure, others not so much. Rahana mentioned the issue of sustainability. And John, um, as we sort of transcend into our next discussion, which is going to be around food security and sustainability, I wonder if you might just want to briefly touch on environment and sustainability to sort of neatly segue us into that next section. <coughs> Well, I mean, sustainability is is the ability to is usually defined as the ability to meet our needs in the present without affecting the needs of generations in the future. Uh, and it strikes me that um, a lot of these you were talking earlier about invisible uh, uh, impacts, and a lot of these are what, what are called boundary problems. People talk about zero impact electric electric cars. But there's no such thing as a, a, a zero emission electric electric car. But that, whenever I see that on the news, my fists clench and I bang the, the arms of the chair because it's not true. Because in building a car, in generating the electricity, somewhere there are some e emissions. It's if you draw the boundary around the car itself as it's driving around, then there are no. Perhaps you could argue there are no emissions, although even that is debatable. But if you look at the whole, the way the car is made, the way the car is disposed of, the way the electricity is made, is produced, if you have a wider boundary in your in 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 your focus, then actually you begin to see that, that actually there are emissions. There's no such thing as zero impact. So it's where that impact is. And I think, you know, as Rahana was sort of bringing um, quite a different lens to your very scientific notion of what's emitted, how we count the various things, we can sort of say, well, you know, there's, there's no sort of right or wrong where we take something has to give. So there's always this um, difference, I guess, in priorities. How might that link? You mentioned um, some of these sort of wicked problems that you're trying to, to solve, John. How might that notion of those wicked problems relate to this idea of, of where our values lie? And I guess those values are going to, to change change depending on policy and context um, so they're probably not fixed either I, th I, th I think I think I think you're right I think one of one of the issues for me is when I hear about home working and so on uh, is, is the question of, of, of what choices do people have I mean haven't we become aware it, 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 in this country during the crisis of our reliance on refuse disposal workers they can't work from home on, on emergency services in terms of medical uh, practitioners. Many of them can't uh, work, work, work from home. So, so there are people in society that don't have the opportunity to work from home. And so, that, so in a sense, stepping away from my scientific technological bias, perhaps, what about the issue of class, social class, understanding how society works is part of the, the, the wicked problem. We can't solve the problem of the environment unless we understand that people are living different lives according to where they are situated in the world and where they're situated in our social structures. 
Absolutely. And it's interesting you say that, John, because I would have expected from that very sort of scientific notion that you'd be more concerned with, you know, the, the various aspects that we had. And yet you're talking on very different levels, which I think relates very much to, to the topic I wanted to start off with you, which is on food sustainability. And this idea that, you know, despite having effectively enough food to fill the world's population, um, yet we have all of these underlying issues that mean that, you know, hunger and, um, you know, unsatisfaction um, are, are very common in particular areas. So, so our question um, is about food sustainability here and has the pandemic changed the way that we eat? And we've asked um, everybody at home if they could um, vote on our widgets. Well, not vote, but, but fill those in. About three things um, that come to, to, to mind about the word um, food security and sustainability. John, can you give us a brief definition of, of what we mean by food security? I'm going to read it out because it's an accepted definition which has been produced by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So it's quite a long and it, definition and it includes quite a lot of stuff that's basically saying food security is when everybody in the world can access the food they need to live a healthy active life and there are it's it's a problem that has many uh, complex parts because it's not just about producing enough food the focus in food for food security many decades ago was about producing more and more more and more food uh, now we have to think about we're more likely to think about both how the food is produced and 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 how the food is used is it nutritious is it is it is it accessible to people so it's a complex it's a complex knotty wicked problem if you like but food security is about people being able to access enough food to meet their needs and there are particular challenges in certain areas. I mean, rather ironically, um, you know, food security can be more of a challenge to those in rural areas who are often farmers. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a correlation and that the farmers can't eat. But nonetheless, we see some of these trends um, happening. What, what, what do we make of those, John? I, I think I think being able to access enough food is, is, is a global problem. I would take a global lens, lens, lens on it. I mean, there are you know the issue of 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 uh, obesity of, is is a form of malnutrition. It's a feature of the Western world where people access tend to access too much food and an inappropriate food. But it's also increasingly a problem in places which have a reputation for for the other type of malnutrition for not having enough food. So in places like Ethiopia and Somalia, actually there are increasing numbers of people who are accessing. Who, 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 who are struggling with the problem of obesity. So it's a worldwide problem. And, and, and the problem of, of having too much food can sit side by side with people having not enough. So even in the developed Western world, you know, in this country, we have food banks because there are many people that through, through poverty cannot access enough food side by side with, with, with issues of, of people accessing too much food and the wrong kind of food and how we solve that problem is not just about i mean i might be drawn to technological solutions uh, and producing new types of food that, that give people uh, access to to nutrition in different ways but actually it's also a cultural question and you can never solve these problems simply by technological uh, uh, quick fixes Mm. And again, a lot of value systems in there in terms of how we farm and what we farm. So despite the fact that we have a sort of calorie limit, I suppose, of 1800 calories a day, which is the threshold of, of having enough, what you're saying, John, is that, you know, according to this definition, it's about safe, nutritious food. And for various different reasons, sometimes it's our value, sometimes it's our access to resources, means that those can't be obtainable for certain people. And yet then this all sort of stems into, I guess, what we should be doing in terms of how much we should be eating of various food groups how much exercise we should be doing and how healthy we are and i guess how that links into various other things it's all very interrelated i wonder who else on our panel would like to, to comment on this george yes i'm reminded of the quote that is attributed to many different people which is we're only ever three square meals away from revolution and i was i was thinking whilst you were talking that um the things that we took for granted before the pandemic, getting a Tesco's delivery, popping to the shops to get X, Y, and Z, that was suddenly taken away from us. 
and it made us feel quite vulnerable, didn't it? And it made us, in some cases, begin to panic and buy a lot of toilet roll um, where we could. So not only are there the scientific elements around food, the need for food, there's, there's a deep psychology there. It's linked, as we've been saying, to kind of people's different, uh, different social statuses. Um, how close you live to a shop suddenly became incredibly important. So I think the pandemic has made us feel a lot more vulnerable than we did before. We took things for granted. We took the availability of food for granted. Those of us that, that are lucky enough to be able to buy food without worrying too much about the money, suddenly we couldn't. And I think that has redressed, that did make a change in society. But as Rahana said earlier, who knows? Now that we are able to go back to going to popping to Tesco's whenever we want to, other supermarkets are also available. Um, whether our behaviours will remain changed, whether we will remember what that felt like. Mm. And, and just sort of reflecting on what you're saying and, and what people are talking about in the chat, Natasha makes a really good point. Um, she says, not only is food poverty linked to obesity because junk food is also very cheap, it's also addictive and there are lots of psychological mm. um, aspects that then become this vicious circle. So we can see even if, for instance, we have money or access to things, that sometimes it's those choices that we're making mm. that perhaps for different reasons aren't necessarily the right choices. And then that's, uh, that's challenging. Catherine um, makes another point about people in Somalia being obese. Um, and getting to the bottom of the balance of nutrition is complex and that seems to be more important than just providing enough calories as, mm. as such. John, what do you make of those points that our students have raised in the chat? Well, I, I was really pleased to hear that, fir that first point because I, I think that the experience of, of the personal experience of the, of, of the pandemic for many people has been an increasing waistline and an increasing consumption of the wrong sort of food. And therefore, I would hope that post pandemic, we might move into a world where people are more sympathetic to the psychological, uh, to the impact of one's psychology and mental health on what one, on what one eats. Uh, you know, if, you know, people in the past have often said, well, have derided people that are overweight as, as being just showing a lack of control. And I hope that emerging out of, out of the COVID crisis, perhaps one thing might be a greater sympathy to people to see it's not just, you know, it's not just about people being weak. Uh, 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 it, 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 it's, it, it's, we should all have an appreciation uh, uh, of how our, our mental health is linked to what we eat. Mm, absolutely, because I think one of the things that um, Natasha comments on is that, um, you know, junk food changes mental health, the lack of nutrients impacts low self esteem. And so we, we can have this cycle going on. But interestingly, I mean, you know, the way in which we farmed has changed. Um, for example, meat is a lot more fatty now because the animals have less room to, to, um, to move around. And so the animals are fatter and therefore the meat content is, is more fatty than it used to be. So there are all of these things that, that we can have in terms of seen and unseen things. Um, other people are sort of reverting back. Graham says that um, you know, he, he did what they used to do in the war and he's been growing his own vegetables. And I think many people have been trying to you know, take a little bit more control and, and get some satisfaction out of nourishing their bodies and, and nourishing the, the soil around them. Well, John. The issue of political, political, uh, political vegan and vegetarianism is, is, a, is, a, is a big one. You know, that our supermarkets suddenly have huge choice in vegan in in the vegan in the vegan diet because people are moving away from meat eating meat because they want to reduce their impact on the environment on the environment mm. Mm. but it, it, it is challenging i think because we have on one hand what food is 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 going in how we then feel about ourselves how we feel about our bodies and what we're eating um, and as philippa says you know lockdowns increase the anxiety and that's had a knock on on exercise and food habits so this whole notion i guess of, of some people comfort eating or trying to control what they eat there's also i guess trying to control what we waste when we're trying to get stuff mm. or i think we've all used our toilet rolls but i know certainly you know because i haven't been able to go out shopping so much when i do see vegetables you know sometimes I was having them then I get so anxious about wasting some of that food so there are lots of different anxieties coming to play Jay let's take a quick trip to you on the on the hot desk because you haven't shown your lovely face and your super <laughs> haircut so which you've now had would you like to say hello and, and fill us in on on some of the other things people are talking about yeah sure hello everybody it's lovely to be here um the chat's going really really well lots of really interesting 
points about Rohana's point about environmental uh, issues and and some of the challenges that we face and actually it's great to see how all of these questions are so linked and I think that boosts that notion of coming from uh, an interdisciplinary background to these sorts of points as well so we've been talking quite a bit about food waste and how food waste did go down in the early days of the pandemic because as you said Karen I think we were so much more aware of what we were using and maybe what we were throwing away but then also the questions now about um, the challenges of, of increasing waistlines and food consumption and why you eat certain foods because they make you feel good um, and then you get into a bit of a vicious cycle because you know you probably shouldn't be over consuming things but you do and that will probably come on quite nicely with one of Martin's questions a bit later about then what we do when we know we've eaten too much and we now need to walk it off or exercise it off as well um, so actually it's great to see how the, all these things are linked um, uh, as well so yeah really dynamic chat today it's great to see brilliant thank you jay well let's take a look at um, our food word cloud and um, we're going to sort of close this section but um i'd also like to raise one of the points janet's made which i've struggled with as a parent myself um which is about um the schools um sending letters homes to parents about um you know children's weight etc um and obviously because the children have had less um, opportunity to go outside and play um they've had less interaction with their peers and certainly you know from my perspective less exercise and so while i might feel i can control what i eat um i see my daughter off and you know comfort eating and, and doing less exercise and, and I really worry about that as well I think it's a really valid point so here we can see some of the things that you've said um, around food and some of them um, are really um, common like cost and poverty um, but also interesting things around smart logistics um, so uh, you know food um, uh, environmental impacts here so there are lots of amazing um, points that we've, we've had which I think leads us to our next section um, which I'm going to talk to Martin about which is on um, that whole relationship with wearable technology. Um, it's been one of those things that, that I've been mindful of with the various step and activity challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, my daughter's constant request for more Fitbits or this, that and the other that can count and measure steps, how we can become sort of very insular around our use of technology to try and measure and monitor um, our health. So Martin, um, I'd like to ask you our question here and, and everybody at home, I'd like you to, you to fill us um, with our word cloud in on uh, what comes to mind around the theme of health and technology. So Martin, um, is new technology, um, like Fitbits and things like that, are they a benefit for health or are they a burden? And what sort of shifted in that respect in terms of the pandemic? Yeah, I think um, Speaker is one of those people who has had an expanding waistline during the pandemic. Um, it follows on quite nicely from the previous uh, topic. I think, you know, in that question, there are two bits to unpick. And the first is like, what do I mean by technology? Second bit, what do we mean by health? And so I think from the technology point of view, I, I sort of labeled it as new technology, but perhaps it's interesting to think what would it have been like 20 odd years ago? So, you know, if the, pand if the pandemic had hit then, what have we got now that we didn't have then? And in terms of health, um, I want to cover both, you know, physical and, and mental health. You know, they've both been uh, affected during the pandemic. So, you know, th there've been lots of positives. I think, you know, there's been things like, you know, the the Joe Wicks classes, you know, all these kind of couch to 5K apps or people taking part in virtual events and wearing Fitbits and trying to get the walking up and those kind of things and being much more outdoors. You know, I, I live near the Taff River. Uh, in Cardiff, and usually that you see a few people along the Taft Trail. And at times, it was like it was busier than uh, the centre of town. You know, suddenly everyone was out walking, which you know, was kind of great to see. But I think there's also uh, some negative effects. I think you know, particularly um, so people have been going online a lot more. Um, and I myself, I spend quite a lot of time on Twitter, partly through my job and everything. But anyone who spends any amount of time on social media, you know. It's difficult to come away from there feeling positive about the world often <laughs> so i think that has a real kind of impact on on mental health um, and i think uh, there have been things that particularly in, in my area of education technology for instance they've been introducing um exam proctoring not necessarily at the ou but but at other places other universities they've just done this kind of video exams those kind of things and that's really invasive type of technology and that just is an example of that sort of feeling of being under surveillance all the time you know you're, you're when you're continually online there's a lot more data being generated you feel like you're just being monitored all the time i think a lot of people find that quite uh, oppressive and also, there's lots of issues around privacy and and ethics and stuff so i think this is a good example of john's kind of wicked problems really you know in that mix it's very inter interdisciplinary so you need you know not just 
computer scientists and uh, healthcare specialists, but you need people who understand psychology and ethics and philosophy and economics and, and sociology to understand the, the, the kind of complex mix of these two things of, of health and, uh, and technology. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting, actually, because I think while the increase in some of these devices, so some of the, you know, wearable devices have gone up massively, um, you know, in, in sort of recent times, there's also this issue, I guess, of performing our sport and fitness, of, of having mm -hmm. things on social media, of, you know, liking everyone's posts, or perhaps judging, you've run too far, you've done this, that or the other. So so by people's actions, and also um, by their lack of actions as well, there is this social thing. And and we know that, that so many aspects of social media are addictive, you know, we can often scroll scroll through things they don't sort of have that end point often um so 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 there's that going on as well and and also the behavioral aspect like so many people have been talking about in the chat about how you can get in these cycles you know with with an increase in scrolling through social media that blue light then may have an impact on our sleep our melatonin levels etc so so again mm -hmm. that can sort of feed into how we feel about ourselves and also how we are in ourselves yeah and again those are kind of good examples of pluses and, and, and minuses and things so I think you're absolutely right there's this whole kind of like performative aspect online and, and people talk about you know FOMO fear of missing out those kind of things and and you often see you know on places like Instagram you see people post you know hey just come back from my 10 mile run before breakfast now I'm off out and you think I've just all I've done is had some toast and sat in my pajamas <laughs> and it can make you feel bad about the whole day before you even start uh, but equally, I think, you know, that there's kind of real positives in a lot of that. So sometimes um, being able to join in a community and share things and you know, and think about all the kind of Zoom meetings people had as a family, even though they were separated physically, they could still meet up and kind of socialise. And, and that was really important for people's kind of mental health and being able to get through a lot of that feeling of isolation. Mm. So there's certainly been some positives and negatives. Let's take a look and see what you said at home. So we'll show the word cloud um, that people have been contributing to. Um, and then I'd like to uh, check in on one of our hot desk colleagues um, to see what people are talking about. And then we can take the discussion further. So here is our word cloud about technology and health. We can see that monitoring, motivation, obsessiveness, communication um, and mental health are coming up as the key things. But other things that are interesting here um, are, are very value laden things, for example, things around um, uh, advancement um, and uh, you know having sedentary lifestyle so there's some things that we sort of perhaps set by others expectations or even our own um, whereas other things um, are, are more I guess robust John might argue things like power usage um, and uh, monitoring things nutrition setting goals and many of those are a lot more um, sort of I guess scientific in their approach of, of, of using devices to measure and record things based on certain parameters. Martin what do you make of, of, of our word cloud? I think it's really interesting actually I think it really gets a lot of the tension that I was talking about there so the words like competition but also motivation and those two things can be sort of two sides of the same coin in a way for some for some people seeing other people going out and doing 10 mile runs is really motivating for them they want to be in that competition they want to go and do it and for other people that's kind of really demotivating and a real kind of feeling of social pressure and inadequacy or whatever and stuff so i think i think that word cloud was very interesting actually it kind of really captured a lot of that, that sort of dynamic between both the positive and, and the negative and Philippa makes a really interesting point, which is this notion that, um, you know, if you post something online saying, I'm going to do this, or I'm doing the couch to 5k, for example, she says that's an incentive. Um, so there's some sort of accountability, you know, if she sort of said she's going to do that, then other people might hold her to it. Um, so, so that's an interesting notion. John, what, what do you make on this topic? The word that leapt out at me on, on, on that word chat was obsessiveness, because I think it, for me social media is often associated with with an obsession you know checking your phone every five minutes all day till the till late at night uh, but also obsession can, can impact on diet for example i know that people trying to lose weight can become obsessed with how many miles they've run does that allow, you know rewarding exercise with with, with with unhealthy food is something I know that I've done and my my friend my friends do. So it was just interesting. I thought that obsessiveness leapt out at me from that word from that word cloud. Absolutely. And as someone who queued for one hour after um, making their daughter do twenty lengths of the swimming pool for some KFC, I'm guilty of that. Jay, let's go to to you on the hot desk, and then we'll come to George. 
Thanks, Karen. Um, I was just pondering about the conversations in the in the in the chat, but also that notion of how websites are often designed to keep us quite addicted. There's almost no um, scrolling off point that you know it keeps us feeding those desires. Um, and the links with some of the research out there about about uh, communication and mental health and social media and all of those sorts of things. So somebody in the chat said a bit about, um, you know, it's like being at bookies, uh, having your phone in your pocket as well. And interestingly, on a social app that I use, um, you can switch a timer on now, which I think is a really good thing. And I've I've used that timer, so it tells me when I've had my 10 minutes for the day, which is actually really helpful because it allows me to think, right, okay, and now I'm going into like extra time. I need to put it down and step away from it. Um, and that's certainly helped me manage my use of that that platform, which can be you know, good for me, but also slightly negative in the way that colleagues and some of our student audience are saying as well. No, absolutely. And if you think about all the time we spend on these things, um, one thing that, that yeah. students often say to me is, you know, the biggest procrastination I have is my phone. If I could just turn that phone off for a bit, yeah. I could get so much more done. Um, but yeah, we, we very often have to check up on things as, as they're happening for fear of missing out. George, mm. what, what do you think? Well, when I was looking at the word cloud just now, one of the words that jumped out to me was solo um, mental health. And I was sort of reminded that during this time, during this pandemic, our individual circumstances have been incredibly different. Some people have been on their own in a house for, for mm. really long periods of time. Others of us have had far too many people in uh, very small, uh, very small confined spaces like homeschooling, which is also not good for your mental health. But, but those different circumstances will lead to different needs and different ways to try and kind of respond to those so i think the connections that are available via social media have be become incredibly important for people that were physically removed from from their kind of social and and family usual relationships another word that that struck out to me was balance and i think we've all struggled to try and maintain some sort of balance and that's been incredibly difficult whilst the world has been so topsy-turvy and then finally my my final thought is the Joe Wicks, the Couch to 5K, the mindfulness, the yoga, all of these things, linking back to things we were talking about with Rahana environment and with, with John thinking about food, is what will be maintained here? What will continue into, dare I say, normal life if that, if that ever returns? Will we continue to think about fitness uh, in the same way or will it be something that we did during this period? So stuff that remains and stuff that we lose, I think is another theme that kind of goes across all of the uh, all of our conversations today. Mm, absolutely. Peter says um, he tries to have a local 45 minutes walk each day. And I think getting into those habits mm. has been something that yeah. many of us um, have started doing more. Natasha says there'll be an addiction group for social media addiction at some point, which I think is, is probably very likely. But I mean, it's interesting that we're talking about these things. You know, Martin's question was about the positives and the negative aspects of some of these devices. Um, and I'm just sort of struck by the notion that while we've got these devices to both monitor and report um, and interact, we also have these things like you were saying about the Joe Wicks classes um you know we, we have access to so much more as well there's almost mm. um, to some extent no excuse because there are these programs and i know um, i can't remember who i think with hani you were saying the other day that that you were surprised by many of your um colleagues that were saying well hey you know we have all these things now people are taking advantage of them and we didn't have to advocate these health programs that people could go and do themselves because now people want and need those sorts of things also um so yeah it's very interesting suzanne is using a lot of podcasts and um is listening to them on their way Way to to walk which is a great use of technology actually we have a student have live podcast as well um, and lots of videos on youtube suzanne so um if you're bored then you can always uh, grab one of those as well to to listen to as i'm sure jay will tell you about in the chat any final thoughts from our panelists before we move on to our next discussion rahana we haven't heard from you for a bit and i'm just wondering if, if there's anything you'd like to to share so Thanks, Karen. I've been thinking a lot about whilst other people have been speaking about the kind of the politics side of things and equity 
equitability and how you know some people there are the haves and have nots and some people have things and some people have access to things that others don't so not everybody has access to wearable tech not everybody has uh, time to do the joe wicks videos because they perhaps were key workers and i think one of the things the pandemic has certainly done is put a lens on inequality actually and i think that's something that we should remember and need to remember certainly with we saw with Marcus Rashford with the food side of things, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, school meals, free school meals for children because there were children who were going without food. And I think we just need to remember that as we go forward and to think, you know, what can we do in our own lives to try and make things more equal for, for other people that we know and we see what can you know it's that kind of kindness gene isn't it what can we do to make things better um, and what can we do to make the environment better to, to you know to, what can we do to be fitter and healthier that doesn't necessarily involve technology um, and sometimes it's those simple things um, so I think that they were kind of really key points for me from today is about inequality but then what can we do to make things better and I think this whole notion that, as you say, this inequality is highlighted is that often I think the pandemic has driven this collective notion that, that there are things that we could all do. If we all do shop locally, et cetera, and continue with some of those behaviours, then the world could be a better place for a lot of people. Um, so, so the notion that, you know, even though we can't change the whole world and these are very wicked problems, as John says, actually having a collective driven goal, even though there may be challenges um, and we may not be able to equally participate in those goals, but, but having that notion of the individual and the collective um, is something that I've been a lot more mindful of as well. So we, we move on now to our final discussion um, of the day, um, which is one that, that George came up with. Um, and this is around the arts and well-being. So we'd like you to fill in our word cloud um, here. What are three words that come to mind when we think of arts and well-being? And George wanted to ask about whether our perception um, of the arts have changed throughout this pandemic. So George, would you like to kick us off? I certainly would. And actually, I think as hopefully as I talk, we'll, we'll continue to see some of the themes that we've been pulling out are relevant in this area as well. So I've been thinking about the arts as entertainment. I've been thinking, them, thinking of them as um, a way of maintaining mental health and well-being and i've been thinking about the arts as a financial concern as a business and um, so that's what i'm going to just talk about for a few minutes now so um particularly during the first lockdown we saw that theaters were closed broad uh, you know the west end was completely silent uh, people couldn't go to concerts couldn't do all the things that they'd been doing before but the first instinct often of some of those particularly large theatres, I'm thinking of the National Theatre, was to push us live performances um, via the internet. So streaming performances that, um, that lots of people wouldn't have otherwise been able to see. I know in our house, the Thursday night um, National Theatre kind of new, new, uh, new play was a real highlight to our week. So there we potentially could see something like the democratization of theater where you didn't have to pay to go you didn't even have to leave the house and you could see these amazing world-class productions similarly there were lots of concerts online similarly there are lots of different performances that um, celebrities were doing maybe from their homes actors performers and um, so we were able to have access to lots of different things which was amazing indeed karen on disney you can now see the original cast production of Hamilton the Musical. <laughs> there you go. I knew it. So, um, thank you. If you haven't seen it, you really should, shouldn't you, Jay? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm a fan. Um, so, so we've had access to a lot of things that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So that's a good thing, isn't it? And actually, there has been a study, um, a social study uh, led by Dr. Daisy Fancourt, who works in uh, the University College of London. And she tracked arts participation in 72,000 adults in the UK and her data, and I'm just going to read this uh, to check that I get it right. The data suggests that people who've spent 30 minutes or more each day during the pandemic on arts activities, and that could be as a participant or as a sort of audience member, um, they reported substantially lower rates of depression and anxiety and greater life satisfaction. And there have been many other studies um, sort of before the pandemic that link performance and um, 
spending time doing artistic endeavors being linked to well-being but it's it's interesting to see that that appears to be even more true during the pandemic so our thinking about well-being as linked to the environment as linked to what we eat as linked to, to, to what we do in terms of exercise is also a relevant theme here. So I think the, um, the long and short of it is the arts are important because they make us feel better. And what better reason is there for being involved in them than that? But of course, we've also been, we've also got a bit of a kind of a positive negative thing going on today, haven't we? And of course, whilst we've been watching all these theatrical productions, musical concerts, et cetera, et cetera, for free, there is a problem with how that's financially sustainable. Now we know um, that there are a lot of people who are suffering financial hardship because they are involved in the arts and the entertainment um, industries. There was a, uh, a study uh, led by the House of Lords which shows that the arts, entertainment and recreation sector shrank by over 44% in the months March 2020 to June 2020. So there's a real reduction in revenue there. And although, and you know, here we're thinking about politics, um, although the government has made some funding available, there's a real worry that that will go to kind of the big, more wealthy institutions, such as the National Theatre. And um, I was reading an article just this morning that was making the point that after, after the pandemic, the Britain's art sector will be less diverse because these smaller community focused, um, often more diverse, little theatre companies, music, music community events aren't getting that funding and there'll be far fewer of those, um, the theory goes, once we emerge out of, out of the pandemic. So there's the democratisation of the arts on one hand, but there is also a lack of equity with, with regard to how being an arts concern uh, is financially viable in the future. Just as a last thing, um, there's been a couple of a couple of art in response to the pandemic. Um, you might want to look up Love in 2020 by Julia Rosa, which is two people kissing, but they've both got surgical masks on. And my favourite is Panic by C.B. Hoyer, which is a toilet roll with don't panic in massive letters <laughs> written on it. Um, so I think as, the, as, as time goes on, we'll see some really interesting artistic responses to what's happened alongside all the data. Brilliant. So, George, you've given us an awful lot there, um, and I'd like to pick up yeah. on a couple of things. So, Clive <laughs> says, um, which I think is a really good point, um, is that accessing theatre online, you don't get that community aspect. And you were talking about some of those smaller theatres. And there's something there about that collective sense of participation. But as you say, you know, things have really shifted. And Natasha says, you know, she's really missed going to the art galleries and museums mm -hmm. and libraries. However, on the other hand, it could be argued that, you know, actually, because a lot of these galleries have been making videos, we've actually been able to get up and close and personal to a lot of artifacts that we wouldn't normally be able to, to access throughout the globe from our comfort of our, our, of our armchairs. So, you know, th th there are those sorts of things. And I think it's interesting because it sort of lends this whole notion of, of online versus face-to-face -face interaction and I think it's one that we're very familiar with you know working and being in the OU mm. as well sometimes we view um you know online things from a deficit perspective we think it's not quite as good but actually it's very interesting because sometimes it's really different and um uh somebody was saying as well about their cello lessons which I was looking at because I've had exactly the same thing so we've had to sort of change the way we do things and I now have my cello lessons on zoom which means that um, my cello teacher can look and stare at me and see what's going on with my soul sawing arm, for example, um, in a way that she wouldn't necessarily, as she calls it, she wouldn't necessarily be able to, you know, do that if we, if we were sort of face to face, because we'd be doing different things and she'd be playing the piano. So these affordances offer us different ways of mm. being and different access to things. Um, so there's the monetization, which, you, which you, you also talk about, yet some people have very effectively been able to monetize it. There's a K-pop band um, and uh, they've been able to um, rake in 20 million dollars in June from a single Single virtual show. Mm. So whilst it's not commonplace, there have been small instances of people being able to monetize this. So it lends that question then, you know, is this an impact of our ability to think and change and shift to use yeah. things for their advantage? Or is it something more fundamental? And I think it might have been difficult during this period for the arts to make a case that they were important when actually the focus has been quite rightly on people getting medical attention, getting food, getting the things that they need to kind of get through the day. Um, just going back to the thing about whether it's better or worse online, 
I was watching a streetcar named Desire uh, with, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the actress, but the cameras were right up really, really close to her face. So my experience of watching her performance was very, very different to how it would have been if I'd gone in the cheap seats behind a pillar, kind of watching it like that. So it's so there, there are definite positives and negatives, but I completely agree with the student that you quoted who said, actually, what's brilliant about going to a live performance is everybody being in the room for that moment, for those shared, um, that there's an atmosphere in there that you can't in any way recreate. I mean, this, this event that we're doing now, I mean, ordinarily in, in olden days, we'd have been all sat together in a room, wouldn't we? And isn't it marvelous that we can do it this way instead? But better or worse, I'm not sure that that's a, that's a paradigm that's necessarily relevant here. Well, it's interesting because um, I, I love this comment. Um, Natasha says that uh, student have live videos have been really helpful. Um, she's struggling with changing, creating a routine, and she feels a lot better um, with this. And, and Paul also talks about mental health and change. Um, and, uh, you know, different situations like closures of the pubs have been difficult for people who've really relied on those um, mm. for, for, for mental health access. Oh, and Robert says this, this is his first student have live event. It's very encouraging. We've got lots more. In fact, we've got one this afternoon oh. as well, Robert. So um, you must make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter on the website so you can check them all out let's go to you john and see what you have to say um, on, on the, the matter of the arts well, i just wondered whether 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 there's an issue about accessibility and particularly for disabled people perhaps that can't easily access arts in, in participation for example uh, i i i run a singing group uh, that uh, meets once a fortnight and some of the people that that come into the zoom sing couldn't attend face to face because they're house they're housebound or they have disabilities. So I just wonder if because because we've had to adopt technologies that fit with the majority of people being stuck at home most of the time, what whether some of that will live on in the arts uh, with because because of this issue of it allowing some groups of people to access things that w weren't able to before. So that mm. might be a positive outcome. Absolutely. And not just accessibility, but also financial access, as Natasha says, can be a, a real issue in terms of actually getting uses of the resources. Other things, we had a student have live um, show a few, a few weeks ago, and one student had used um, an iPad to create this most incredible drawing. Um, so using technologies in different ways also offers affordances, sometimes based on people who need them, but also can be taken up by other people. So there's this constant shift, I think, with, with, with what's happening. Jay, can we come to you? Um, and, and see what, what other things people are talking about back at home. And I'd also like to, to show our word clouds so that we can see if there are any final things that um, we can pick up on. Jay. Yeah. yeah, of course. I was just thinking, as you said then, about drawing with an iPad, that the artist David Hockney has been drawing with iPads and, and they're going to show some of his work um, based on where he is. And actually what's great about that is not only do you see the end result, but you also see all the different stages along the way. And as somebody who's from an arts background, Actually, what's fascinating is seeing the way that an artist creates their picture but rubs things out and then makes it better or makes it different. And actually, that's really liberating because sometimes I think also when I used to teach art, my students would be so frustrated with what they couldn't do um, and they want this sort of sense of perfection. So it's great to see that somebody famous, somebody well known, kind of does things wrong uh, as well. But the, the chat is very much around saying how important the arts have been, the mental health, how different people have used them to support their mental health, and actually how many people say, you know, out after this time, we also want to remember some of these techniques because the what they have given us, what they've helped us with, whether that's watching videos to help you get out of bed, help you have a bit of motivation, whether that's around knitting um, and nattering over Zoom with friends, those sorts of things, or having dinner parties. Um, and as George says, you know, sometimes the, the, the notion of having online events help with location as well, so that um, we don't all have to be in the same room. And that's liberated, uh, in my life as well, that's liberated things that I can do with friends as well. So a lot of students are saying just how important all of these um, features are, um, but at the same time, I think we're all curious as to see what will stay in the future and what might drop away as things open up again. 
Mm, it will be interesting. Flora makes a good point um, about uh, sometimes technology can exclude people. So I think while like I think most of us can log on to Zoom or something like that, there have been some instances where, you know, I've, I've seen organisers really struggle with the uses of some technologies and that, that can exclude people both emotionally um, and also practically if they aren't able to access those various things. Philippa also says that it's all about a balance. So it's about finding a balance between food, exercise, mental health socializing and work etc and we sort of taps into so many of the things we've been discussing let's take a look um, at our word cloud and uh, see if there are any final things we can pick up from that so here's what everybody at home said um, about perceptions of the art changing so the key thing people are talking about here is mental health and it seems that that relates to various things like escapism creativity um, entertainment um, fun so lots of positive aspects here um, other things uh, coming into play um, are, are things like you know doing yoga online so some of the things that we do are shifting as well um, but equally as, Jay men as, as George mentioned about the funding so people are saying things are underfunded etc um, missed concerts and, and some of the things that we've actually had to miss out on um, um, anything anyone would like to pick up from any of these word clouds? Rahana. It's a really interesting point. I really love the fact that somebody's put crafting in there. And certainly one of the things that I noticed with lots of friends and family where they discovered new found hobbies and interests that they'd yeah. never had before because they had the time and opportunity to do that. And one really good friend locally has actually created a business out of her artistic endeavors, which is taking leaves and um, doing screen printing with them. And then you leave them to dry wow. in the sun and she set up this amazing business off the back of what she found out about herself in uh, the first lockdown. So I think there's been an opportunity for people to explore their own creativity as well, which um, is really good for your mental health, of course which is fab. Mm, absolutely. Thank you, Rahana. And Peter, um, I love this idea. Peter's attended a sketch club um, and uh, he says that the, the motto is you can only improve on a blank piece of paper, which I think is amazing. <laughs> Jay, incidentally, um, she runs a creative um, note taking workshop for us, which is brilliant. And many people go away with that. Um, you know, sort of with this idea that, that we don't have to do things perfectly. It's all about finding yeah. our way and using our own creativity yeah. to help make sense of the world around us. So that's um, mm -hmm. that's on the catch up that you can watch. Jay might put a link to that as well. Um, Suzanne's 82 year old dad says everything in moderation and he is so right. Mary, can we come to you um, uh, sort of for our final thoughts today? Um, and just to sort of round up uh, in terms of what, what people have been discussing. It's certainly been a, a very fruitful and prolific discussion, very interconnected also, despite the fact that we've had four quite discrete areas to cover. Yeah, the, the the chat's been really, really good, and it's been it's been great to see everybody engaging. And like you say, throughout the the, the topics, there's you know um, they've all been feeding into each other really well. But I think I think this last. Um, the last kind of conversations that have been going on are all about finding that balance, finding that moderation, which is so important. And I think that's kind of been quite a good thread through all the topics we've discussed this morning. Um, and th there have been really, some really positive um, feedback as well that, that people have really enjoyed this session, which has been great. And as I said, it's my first session, so I've really enjoyed it. So thank you so much, everyone, for really engaging in the chat. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for organising it. It's always an interesting one when we work with the open programme because there is so much to cover. Um, and it's always very mindful as somebody. I mean, I think many of us have approached things at various stages in our lives um, from different perspectives. You know, I, I was an art student and then, then ended up doing sciences, etc. So very often we'll shift. But isn't it interesting how actually, irrespective of what we're studying, we can all discuss something in a really fruitful way, unpicking some of the areas that um, perhaps hadn't been obvious to us. I know I've learned something new about Netflix today that, uh, that, that, that really horrified me, actually. And I'm going to think twice about my, my usage in future. <laughs> um, but it's been really, really wonderful today. Um, thank you all of our panel, George and uh, John and Martin and Rahana and Linda and Mary and Jay on our chat. But most of all, thank you everybody at home for participating. Um, as I said, we have um, a subscription. Uh, you can just put your email into the Student Hub Live uh, website and then you can subscribe to our newsletter. We send that out once a month. 
month. We have events on throughout the whole calendar year, um, which are all programmed and set in place, but we only advertise those about three weeks in advance of each session. Um, you can also follow us on Eventbrite as well, um, but we will send out those newsletters. We've got quite a nice program coming up over the summer, and we've got an event this afternoon, which is a celebration of our Access students' achievements. And then we're also having various events for uh, several of the schools um, and things on motivation and continuing to study. So make sure that you check those out. We have two interfaces. This is our broadcast event, but we also do study skills workshops in Adobe Connect. And if you are going to have a little break over the summer, we're going to be ramping up, uh, getting ready for module start with some lovely skills development sessions um, that are suitable for all students at all levels. Natasha says lockdown gave her time to catch up and rethink her path, which led her to studying and writing more stories, which I think is wonderful. Oh, and she also says the um, note taking session was uh, incredibly helpful. And she watched last week's session. So highly recommended by Natasha there for us. Right. Well, that is all we have time for today. So thank you all so much for watching. And please do join us at another event soon. You're all very, very welcome. It's been really lovely talking with you. I hope you really have a nice rest of the day, no matter what the weather's doing and where you are, um, and see you at another event very soon. Bye for now, everyone.